you drive um, a red Fiesta. Oh, that's pretty loud. <laughs> Uh, the registration is HXZ3144. You might be interested to know that the passenger side window is fully down, just in case it rains. All right. If you don't want to be conspicuous getting up now and walking out, wait till the opening hymn when everyone's standing, and then you can slip out and put the window up. I'm going to sing a hymn that we sing sometimes here at Hebron, What Gift of Grace is Jesus my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. Just keep our seats. <clears throat> what gift of grace is thinking of the promise that the Lord has given his people to bring us home and we're going home one day this world is not our home the hymn said we're just passing through heaven is the home of the believer and we know that Ernie down in Oma one of the elders there and well known to the church here is is going home and he's going home soon so remember Ernie remember the family continue to pray for them please whenever we were visiting in Romania last week over Easter time we visited an old saint of God. He was a member of Pastor Emmanuel's church. And he too was going home. And he was dying with cancer. And 
uh, we had the opportunity to have just a lovely time of fellowship with him. He asked me two questions. He said, what do you think of me? And he says, why do you believe in God? And I answered the second question first. And then I said, you've asked a difficult question because I don't know you really. But what I have learned from you, you're my brother in Christ. And he liked that answer. And then I quoted that hymn, it doesn't matter what church you belong to. As long as for Calvary you stand, if you're washed in the blood of the Redeemer, you're my brother, so give me your hand. And from the bedclothes, he reached out his hand, and I shook his hand. My brother in Christ just heard this morning that he's with the Lord today. He's in a better place. He's gone home, and that's really what it's all about for the child of God. Our opening hymn is 172, thinking about the Holy Spirit tonight and we love these hymns in the section of the hymn book that deals with the Spirit of God. Lord, as of old at Pentecost, thou didst thy power display with cleansing, purifying flame descend on us today. And the great cry of the hymn writer in the chorus is, Lord, send the old time power. For that's what we need in this day and generation. Let's sing it with all of our hearts. Standing this time to sing. Lord, as I
Let's pray together. Let's seek the Lord. Lord, as we sing these words together, it is the desire of our heart that we might experience something of this song in truth. As we wait here on the final night of our Bible week, as we come to think about the life in the Spirit, Lord, we do need the Holy Ghost, need the power of God, and we would cry from the very depths of our hearts, send the old-time power, the Pentecostal power, the church needs it, we need it. We see those disciples waiting earnestly after the ascension of Christ to glory in that place of prayer, calling upon the Lord faithfully for 10 days, gathering together every day to seek the face of God and pleading undoubtedly the promise of the Father. And then when the day of Pentecost was fully come, when the disciples were gathered together in one place and were in one accord, the heavens opened, the Spirit of God came like a rushing mighty wind and filled that room where they were sitting and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Nor we rejoice that you gave them power, power to witness, power to preach. And out into the streets of Jerusalem they went and preached Christ, particularly in his crucifixion and resurrection. And Lord, sinners were converted, many of them. Multiple sinners turned to Christ that day. <coughs> and Lord, we thank you for the repeated visitations of the Spirit that we read about in the Acts of the Apostles. You came again and again and again. You poured out your power. You did it in church history. You look back over the centuries of time and, Lord, you visited various parts of the world. Sometimes it was a whole nation that experienced the outpouring of the Spirit. Sometimes it was a town or a city or maybe an individual church, maybe an individual Christian for that matter, and you set them on fire. And when that happened, we know that fire catches fire and the, the revival, the movings of God spread and Lord, we're seeking for such again in this day and generation. It is your promise. We plead the promise of God. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon dry ground. Oh, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? We pray that you'll rend the heavens and come down and Lord, visit our churches, visit our people. Visit me, Lord, with the old time power. And as we go forward to be that witness and to preach Christ, we do pray that sinners will be converted and thy name glorified. Thank thee for this week. You've been with us night by night. You've helped the preacher. You've helped the congregation too to sit and listen, to take in your word. And this is a final night, but it's a new night again. And Lord, we're seeking thee afresh for the blessing of God to be upon the preacher particularly, that he might know God's anointing. As he turns to your word, reads the passage of scripture, preaches the message that you've laid upon his heart. Lord, may he know the quickening power of the spirit. Give him utterances in the Holy Ghost. And we know that that kind of preaching is bound to reach our hearts. Oh, spirit of God, work in us too. Move in this church tonight. Breathe upon your people. Do a work of real grace that will be lasting. We don't want a week like this to come and go and for us to forget about it so quickly. We're always longing at, at every service, but particularly a Bible conference that as God deals with his people, as he speaks to us, that there'll be a lasting work done. Do that work even tonight. Bless the young people as they've gone away today for the weekend. Lord, be with them. Send them the breath of God. Help Greg in the ministry of the word and the other leaders too as they, they seek just to come alongside our young people and be an encouragement and a strength to them. And remember Ernie tonight, coming near the end of life's journey. Lord, give him his heart's desire. He wants to be with the Lord, which is far better. We pray that that passage will be an easy one for him. And that you will surround his bed of sickness and bless the family that are waiting with him. Thank you too for that gentleman that we met in Romania, Sabine. And Lord, we rejoice that he's with the Lord today. And that's what he also desired. Remember his dear wife and family. We commit them in love to thee now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray.
Amen. 181. My Holy Spirit, Lord, alone can turn our hearts from sin. And we'll sing this one again. It's about the Spirit of God. And may we pray what we are singing tonight and really mean it from our hearts. Thank you. in doing so as the bread of life is broken we're listening to the Saviour sitting at his feet and that's a tremendous privilege the Lord has been here night by night and we want to welcome you again this evening if you're here for the first time on the final night a special welcome to you and lovely to see children young people that are here may God bless you as well as the older folks and those joining us on the internet whatever media you're listening to this meeting through welcome in the Lord's name so we bask at the door, just remember that we mentioned it last night, we want to have a love offering for the preacher and want to encourage him in the Lord, really appreciate him coming night by night. I want you to pray for the young people that have gone away on their youth weekend just before six o'clock, we went out uh, to the car park, prayed with them and off they went and we trust that it will be a time of real blessing for them. I want you to pray for the meetings on the Lord's Day that we'll have a visitation of God after this Bible week from the prayer meeting at eight o'clock through Bible class, Sunday school, worship service, and the evening meeting. We're doing a study in Mark's gospel, and we're coming to three great questions, and we're going to look at the first one on the Sabbath morning. It's a political question, uh, so pray as we bring that, that message. Then on 
Thursday night, next Thursday night, the 18th, we want to bring the report on the visit to Romania that we had over the uh, Easter period. But we're here for the Bible conference and we welcome the preacher, Reverend Higginson again from Lisburn. And we appreciate his ministry coming night by night and the subject that he's dealt with and the various aspects of that subject night by night. And he comes to deal with a very important subject this evening, life in the spirit. Brother, we trust that you'll have freedom and liberty as you've had in past nights and that God will minister through you to us as you open the scriptures of truth. God bless you. Thank you so much, Reverend Park, once again for your extremely kind words of welcome. And it is a joy to be with you tonight. It's so encouraging again to see so many gathered in. I thought after Monday night that the numbers would go down night after night, and with the young people being away tonight, I wondered, is there going to be really anybody here apart from the faithful few? But we're delighted to see you, and it has been a tremendous uh, blessing to me uh, over this last week. I'm sure that I have been blessed much more than you have to be here, and I want to thank you for your fellowship, and for your prayers, and for your encouragement, and we wish you all God's richest blessing. We're going to miss you. It's been nice to get to know the folk in Balamoni a little bit better over these last number of nights. It's been a real blessing to me to renew fellowship with some from Coleraine, a church that's ever dear to my heart. And we're so encouraged to see uh, some of the young folk from Coleraine this evening and others as well. And we pray that God will bless each and every one of you. So I'm going to miss you. I say that sincerely. Uh, whenever I was a student in Bible college, I started there in 2004, so it's almost 20 years ago. Uh, the Reverend Ian Kenny asked me to fill in for him. He was booked to speak in the Jesus Saves Bible Church, uh, right in the heart of Tigers Bay in North Belfast. I'd never been before, and I remember going for what I thought would be a couple of nights, but he was actually booked to speak uh, every night for a month, and I was filling in for him and they asked me to take then the evangelistic meeting on a Thursday night and so I did the Bible study and then the evangelistic meeting every night for a month and then whatever happened the following month uh, the speaker couldn't come to that either so they were really scraping the barrel and they said to me would you stay on for another month and uh, it was a blessing to me because they prayed me through college I believe for my exams and I attribute any exams that I passed to a large portion of the prayers of those people. So I was there for two months, two nights a week. And at the end of it, I said to them, you'll be glad to see the back of me. And several people shouted out, amen. And <laughs> one of them was the pastor. So he was, he was glad to see the back of me as well. So, but I've gone back over the years and it's, I hope you're not too glad to see the back of me. We wish you God's blessing in the days that lie ahead. And we pray that God will encourage the young folk from this church over the weekend and bless the outreach ministry later on in the year, the gospel mission in the high school. And let's pray in these days for a move of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our churches, and in our nation. We desperately need something from heaven. And we pray that God will challenge our hearts this evening. John's Gospel, please, chapter 16. The 16th chapter of the gospel according to St. John. As we think about life in the spirit this evening, there are many, many portions of scripture that we could have considered and will consider. And the night's gone by. We're looking at this, another subject in a topical sense, considering uh, something of what the Bible says generally about life in the spirit. So we're going to cover quite a bit of ground tonight and we trust that we'll cover it quickly and concisely. But let's read from verse 7, please, of John 16, reading down to the 14th verse. John 16 and verse number 7. Jesus Christ is the speaker. He's in the upper room. He's soon to go to the cross. And so these are very, very deep and intimate words he's speaking to the disciples. Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. 
And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he... The spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine. And shall show it unto you. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his precious and inspired word tonight. If there was a text that we could uh, hang this sermon upon, it would be verse number 7 of John 16, where the Savior says to his disciples, in the middle of the verse, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Let's pray together and let's call upon the name of our Lord. Let's pray. Loving God and eternal Father in heaven, we want to give thee thanks, O God, for another opportunity of sitting around thy feet. We thank thee, Lord, for the fellowship that we have enjoyed with the saints over this last week. We thank thee, Lord, for every individual gathered in tonight and for others who have been in before. And we pray in the Savior's name that the Spirit of God will really Apply thy word to your hearts. So we pray in Jesus' name that each child of God tonight might be encouraged in their faith and challenged and stirred and strengthened and enabled to go on and to go through with God. We thank thee, Lord, for this church. We thank thee, Lord, for the denomination that we belong to. We bless thee, O God, for others, O God, outside of it that know and love the Savior and are faithful to the Lord. We thank thee for the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ across the world. We pray in the Savior's name that thou will visit thy people and grant, O God, that we might know what it is to follow on to know the Lord, to experience the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And we pray that even tonight we might have a a touch of God, a, a breath from heaven, even a time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. So, Father, revive our hearts. Glorify and exalt thy Son. And grant, Lord, that each one here tonight might have an encounter with God. Meet us, each one, at the point of need. And in answer to prayer, we ask that thou wilt uplift and magnify and exalt far above all our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name and for thy glory that we pray. Amen. Uh, Just recently, I was reading a book about Ernest Shackleton who came from the south of Ireland. He was a famous explorer, and he accompanied uh, Captain Scott on his famous and yet tragic expedition to be the first man to reach the South Pole. Whenever they got there and they arrived late, they noticed a Norwegian flag flying that had been placed there by another explorer, Norwegian uh, man called Roald Amundsen who was the first man to find the magnetic North Pole and the first man to reach the South Pole. And on one occasion, whenever Roald Amundsen was going on one of his great exploration trips, he was ascending a mountain, one of the tallest mountain peaks that had been reached at that particular time. And he told his wife that whenever he arrived at his destination, he would have a homing pigeon with him. He would release that pigeon and it would fly back And she would know that whenever she saw that dove or that pigeon, that her husband had made it to his destination and he was alive and well. And Jesus Christ our Lord here in John chapter 16 and verse number 17 tells his disciples whose hearts are heavy that he is going. He has already told them in chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And here in John 16, 7 he says, it is expedient for you that I go away. I believe he was speaking primarily here about going to the cross. 
And that was certainly expedient for them and for us tonight as well. Because had our Lord not gone to that cross, we would never have an opportunity of knowing God and being in heaven one day. And he also was sure then that if he went and went to the cross and then ascended up into glory, he would send the comforter. And whenever the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost in all of his fullness and all of his power, there were multitudes who maybe doubted the gospel, doubted the resurrection, but whenever the Spirit of God came in power and authority upon his church and upon his people, and they went out with power and preached the word of God, multitudes came to believe that the one who was crucified upon the cross was now risen and ascended up on high and is alive forevermore. Friends, tonight in living a life that counts, we're not thinking about our talents and our gifts and our abilities, but we're thinking more about our surrender, our supplication, and our service. Primarily all under the influence and anointing of the Holy Spirit. Night after night, as we have gathered around the Word of God, I have to be honest and say that I've been speaking to my own heart perhaps more than anybody else because I know my needs and I know my faults and feelings and my shortcomings. And I certainly know that I have not really arrived as a, as a Christian or as a pastor or as a preacher or even as a husband or as a father. There's so much ground to be possessed, so much growing still to do. And we're so thankful tonight that with regards to living in light of eternity, living a life of supplication, a life of surrender, and a life of service. The Lord has not left us in this world to struggle and just to try our best and hope for the best and do the best we can and then get discouraged because we realize that in our flesh we can really do nothing. Jesus Christ our Lord has sent the Spirit of God and gifted the Holy Ghost to his blood-bought people, his blood-bought church. Now the truth of the matter is, the church of Jesus Christ can do nothing without the blessing of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 15, the Lord said to his disciples, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit. And he said in verse 5, that without me ye can do nothing. And so he has said to them, I've chosen you to be fruitful, but in and of yourselves you cannot bring forth fruit. And that is therefore why, one of the reasons why he sent the Holy Spirit. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is spoken of in great detail by our Lord Jesus Christ in John 14, John 15, and John 16. In this great discourse in the upper room when he sat there with his disciples before going to Calvary. It's my conviction tonight that the person and work and ministry of the Holy Spirit has been greatly misunderstood by many in the evangelical church. And sometimes as well, because of excess and because of error, those who are evangelical and those who are orthodox and reformed and separated oftentimes neglect the person and work of the Holy Spirit for fear of the false we threw out the baby with the bathwater. In Acts 19, whenever the Apostle Paul went to the great city of Ephesus and he met some church leaders there, he asked them a question. I believe he asked them the question to test the waters to find out just how much they understood and where they were spiritually. And the question was simply this, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And the reply was quite astounding. One of them said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he was acknowledging something of his ignorance of the doctrine and the reality and the personality of God, the Holy Spirit. I wonder tonight if we are honest, how much do we really know? Theologically and doctrinally, yes, but much more than that. How much do we really know experientially? and personally and intimately of the movings of the Spirit of God in our lives. There are many names in the Bible given to the Holy Ghost. He is called the Spirit of God. He is called the Comforter. He is referred to as the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Wisdom, 
the spirit of understanding, the paraclete, the spirit of holiness. He has given many titles, and we might know those titles, and we might know those names. But do we know him? Do we know the ones spoken of in those names being given? I just want tonight to give a simple overview concerning the person and work of the Holy Spirit and how he applies to our day-to-day -day Christian living. If we want to be effective, then we must experience life in the Spirit. I'm just taking tonight the word Spirit and using it as an acrostic, S-P-I-R-I-T. The letter S tonight is standing for the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. The sovereignty of the Spirit. And by sovereignty, I mean to you to understand that the Holy Spirit is the sovereign God of heaven. The Holy Spirit is God. Now this is one truth among many fundamental Bible truths that is often denied by cults and false religions and liberals and modernists. Many, sadly and tragically, have reduced the person of the Holy Spirit to a mere force or an influence. And they have robbed the Holy Spirit of his essential sovereignty and his essential deity. Now, it's very easy to go to the Word of God and prove beyond any shadow of doubt that the Holy Spirit is God. For example, in Acts chapter 5, in the opening verses, we are introduced to a, a couple within the church called Ananias and Sapphira. And they sold certain of their possessions freely. And then they told the church that they had given all of the proceeds to the Lord, but they hadn't. The problem wasn't that they'd held anything back. The problem was they were trying to convince people they had given more than they really had pretending to be something that they weren't. And the apostle came and challenged them and said, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie unto the Holy Ghost? Thou hast kept back part of the price. And then we read in the fifth verse, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And so Peter was clearly highlighting the Holy Spirit is God, the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. In our Lord's ministry in Matthew chapter 12, he spoke about the awful sin of the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And that in itself indicates that the Holy Spirit is God. The baptismal formula is to go into all the world and, and to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, 7 says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And then, of course, the Spirit of God performs divine works. Works that are only possible through God and by God himself. For example, in Job 33, 4, Job says, The Spirit of God hath made me. The psalmist said in Psalm 104, 30, Thou sent forth thy Spirit, and they were created. The Holy Spirit performs the work of creation. The Holy Spirit imparts life in John chapter 6 and 63. It says it is the Spirit that quickeneth. It is the Spirit that gives life. Man breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath or the Spirit of life and man became a living soul. The Holy Spirit gives physical life. The Holy Spirit as well gives spiritual life. And then the Spirit of God displays divine attributes. Old theologians used to talk about God's incommunicable attributes. That is, attributes or characteristics that can only be found in God and nowhere else. For example, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present. And in Psalm 139, the psalmist said, Whither shall I run from thy presence, and whither shall I flee from thy spirit? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. And he's indicating that the Holy Spirit is everywhere present. The Holy Spirit is also almighty, omnipotent. Whenever Mary was told that she would conceive in her womb and bring forth a son, she wondered about that and she questioned that. And she was told with God, nothing shall be impossible. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. 
And that thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And the Spirit of God had that almighty power to cause Mary to conceive supernaturally and bring the Savior into the world. The Spirit of God is also omniscient. He knows all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 10. God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And it says in verse 11 that there are certain things that no man knoweth, but the Spirit of God does. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And he's also referred to in Hebrews chapter 9, 14 as the eternal Spirit. And all of these wonderful Bible truths show us the deity, the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. Then the letter P stands for the personality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person within the Godhead. We believe tonight in one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. But the God that we serve is revealed in three distinct persons who are co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal. The same in substance and power and equal in glory. Whenever you think about water, you can have water in liquid form. You can have water in solid form or ice. And you can have water in vapor form, steam. Now chemically, they're all exactly the same. But they're all distinct and they're all different. One is solid, one is liquid, one is gas. They're all different, but they're all the same. Now, it's very difficult for us to understand the concept of a triune God, three God, three persons revealed in one God, God the Father, distinct from God the Son, God the Son, distinct from the Holy Spirit, and yet they are one in substance and equal in power and glory, and the Holy Spirit is a personality, not a force or not just an influence, but the Holy Spirit is a real person. John chapter 14 and 15 and 16, there are many times where personal pronouns are attributed to the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ does not describe the Holy Spirit as it. He describes the Holy Spirit as he. But when the Comforter is come, he will show you all things. He will glorify me. He shall receive of mine. He shall show it unto you. He shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. And it becomes immediately clear from the language of our Lord that the Holy Spirit is not only God, but he's also a distinct person. He also displays personal characteristics. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11 says that the Holy Spirit possesses knowledge. Romans chapter 15, 30 speaks about the love of the Holy Spirit. He has the capacity to love. Did you ever think about that? You know tonight that you're loved by God the Father. You know as well that you're loved as a believer by God the Son. But did you ever think that you're also loved by the person of the Holy Spirit? The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost loves his people. God loves you tonight. Never forget about the love of the Holy Spirit. The word of God in Nehemiah 9 and 20 speaks about the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. He's able to impart knowledge. Ephesians 4.30 says that the Spirit of God can be grieved. The Spirit of God mourns. He grieves. He can be hurt. He can be saddened. He can be offended. And these are all characteristics of personality. And then there's also the activity of the Holy Spirit that shows his personality. 1 Corinthians 2.10 says he searches. Revelation 2 and verse 7. Hear what the Spirit saith on the churches. The Holy Spirit speaks. Galatians 4.6 says the Holy Spirit cries. Romans 8.26 says the Holy Spirit prays. John 15.26 says the Holy Spirit testifies. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit teaches. Romans 8, 14, the Holy Spirit leads. Acts chapter 16, 6 and 7, the Holy Spirit gives commandments. Paul says we were forbidden 
of the Holy Spirit to go to Asia. And then we say to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered us not. He commanded us not to go. You see there again his sovereignty. He also appoints people, separate me Paul and Barnabas, the Spirit of God said, for the work that I have appointed for them. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit strives or wrestles. Maybe you're not a Christian tonight. Genesis 6-3, God says, my spirit shall not always strive or wrestle with man. And maybe like Saul, you've been kicking against the pricks. You've been troubled about your sin. You've been concerned about your soul. You felt guilt in your heart about your past. You're concerned about your future. You're not ready to die. You're not ready to meet God. You know that you've never been born again. And maybe the Spirit of God has been striving with you. That is the characteristic and the action of personality. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And therefore, as a person, a personality, the Holy Spirit is knowable. This is life eternal, the Lord Jesus Christ said. That they might know thee, the only true God, God the Father, and Jesus Christ, God the Son, whom thou hast sent. And we also as Christians have the privilege of knowing personally and intimately the Holy Spirit. The sovereignty of the Spirit, the personality of the Spirit, and then the letter I, the indwelling of the Spirit. This is one of the most profound and magnificent truths in all the, the Word of God. That every true Christian, every true believer, everyone who has been born again of the Spirit of God, redeemed by blood, who has repented of sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, is indwelt personally by the Spirit of the living God. Isn't that an amazing truth? That the Spirit of God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He dwells in these bodies of ours, these jars of clay that have been formed and fashioned by the hands of Almighty God himself. Paul says in Romans 8 and verse number 9, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And that indicates that everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ has in them, indwelling in them, the Spirit of the living God. Whenever Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, in his first letter, a church that was struggling with pride and disunity and immorality and all sorts of different things. He said, do you not know that you are the, the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth within you? You're not bought with a price. Or rather, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Glorify God in your bodies which are the Lord. Second Timothy 1.14, the Spirit of God dwelleth in us ever thought about that Christian that the very God of heaven dwells in you by the person of the Holy Spirit it's an amazing truth whenever John Wesley and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield and a group of others were studying at Oxford University striving after holiness and purity of life somebody put a, a booklet into the the hands of one of them and that little booklet passed around it was written by a young man from Aberdeen University. He was actually a lecturer in Aberdeen University. His name was Henry Skugel. And like Robert Murray McShane, he only lived to the age of 29. And the title of the book was simply The Life of God in the Soul of Man. And the very title of that book convicted them that they were missing out on something. That their religion was all about externalities and the works of the flesh and human endeavor. And the one thing that they needed was the new birth. And they came to know God intimately and personally and realized that the Spirit of God dwells within every, every believer. The Christian is a person who is more than just forgiven. The Christian, the child of God, is a person who has the Spirit of the living God dwelling in them, living in them, empowering them and blessing them and making the things of God real. So many Christians seem to have forgotten this truth. Robert Murray McShane once said, the Christ in you will never fight with the Christ in me. And if we were sensitive to the Spirit of God as we ought to be, I think there would be a lovely unity in the church of Jesus Christ. Samuel Logan Brengel was a holiness preacher in the ranks of the Salvation Army. 
And there's many things that I wouldn't agree with regarding his theology. But you certainly cannot doubt the man's desire and zeal. He was the successor of General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. And Mr. Brengel has many books, Helps to Holiness, The Way of Holiness. And one book is entitled, The Guest of the Soul. It's a book about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tonight is the guest, a heavenly guest who lives in the human soul of all of his people. And that again shows us not just his personality, but his deity. He's everywhere present. He dwells in you. He dwells in me. He dwells with believers in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Right across the world, he's living in his people. The letter R stands for the role of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit actually do in the life of a Christian? He does many, many different things. We read in John 16 here in verses 8 through 11 that one of the things that he does is he convicts or he reproves. He convicts of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. John 3, he regenerates, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, cannot see the kingdom of God. Romans 8, 16, he gives the believer assurance. He assures us that we belong to the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 He sanctifies. He sets us apart. He enables us to grow in grace. Acts 9.31 He strengthens. John 16.13 He guides. Hebrews 3.7 He speaks. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 He empowers. Ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. John 14, 16, he comforts. That's one of his titles, the comforter. He also cultivates character. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says we are changed from glory into glory, ultimately into the image of Jesus Christ. He cultivates Christian character. Galatians 5, 22 to 24, he produces fruit in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Romans 8, 26, he aids us and helps us in prayer. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, he reveals truth. Galatians 5, 16, he gives victory. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Romans 14, 17, he imparts joy. The Bible speaks there about joy in the Holy Ghost. John 14, 26, he brings to remembrance whatever the Lord has spoken unto us. If you're like me tonight, your memory mightn't be all that great, but sometimes the Spirit of God brings truths to our remembrance just at the right time and in the right way. 1 Corinthians 2 and 4 and 5, he anoints men to preach the word of God. Paul said, when I came to you, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. He anoints and imparts power to preach, and primarily he testifies of Jesus Christ. John 15, 26, when the comforters come, whom I shall send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And these are all things that really only the Spirit of God can do. Leonard Ravenhill once said, men give advice, but God the Holy Spirit gives guidance. As a young Christian one year, I think it was the very first year I ever attended the Martyrs Easter Convention. I remember prowsing around the bookstall and lifting a book, The Life and Diary of Andrew Bonner. And he was a great preacher from Scotland. His brother Horatius Bonner was the famous hymn writer. They were both great friends of Robert Murray McShane. Andrew Bonner had a very successful ministry. And towards the end of his ministry, a young man was converted under his preaching. And this young babe in Christ loved his pastor. He loved Andrew Bonner. He loved to hear him preach. He loved to hear him pray. He loved to ask him questions. And he grew so much in grace as those er in those early years as a Christian under the ministry of the saintly Andrew Bonner. So much so that he felt 
he could not survive as a Christian without the leadership and the preaching and the counsel of Andrew Bonner. And then Andrew Bonner sadly passed away. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, that young man couldn't bring himself to go to church. He struggled with doubts. He wondered what the future held, who's going to be my mentor, my counselor now. And one day, sitting in a park in that Scottish city, there was a young woman pushing a large pram through the pathway in the park. And there was a little baby evidently in the park because the young man heard the baby crying. And sitting at the edge of the pram, there was a young toddler who was maybe two or three years of age. And that toddler was sort of leaning into the pram and causing the baby to cry. And the mother was heard to say these words. It's quite remarkable. She said, stop leaning on Andrew Bonner. So the little baby was called Andrew. And the little boy was called Bonner. And this young man sitting in this park heard those words. Stop leaning on Andrew Bonner. And he realized that he'd been trusting man rather than trusting in God. You know, only God could bring about a situation like that. The Bible says it is better to put our trust in the Lord than put our confidence in men. The arm of the flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. The Holy Spirit is indispensable in his roles. He can do things that none of us could ever do. I believe if the Spirit of God came down in great power in a meeting like this, more could be done in a few divine minutes that can be done in a lifetime of labor. The mighty power of the Holy Spirit. That's why God's people in these days need to pray for revival and seek God for a move of the Holy Spirit. The sovereignty of the Spirit. The personality of the Spirit. The indwelling of the Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit. And then there's another letter I in there, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is indwelt by the Spirit of the living God. But not every Christian is infilled with the Spirit of the living God. I think that becomes very evident whenever we look at the church of Jesus Christ. Generally, it becomes evident that many of us are maybe not living Spirit-filled lives. Paul writing to the church of Ephesus said in Ephesians 5, 18, Be not drunk with wine, we're in a success. Isn't it sad that preachers have to tell their congregations and their people not to get drunk? The best way not to get drunk is to never start drinking in the first place. And then Paul goes on to say, But here's something much better. Here's something much more profitable. Here's something much more beautiful and much more beneficial. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Be not drunk with wine or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's interesting that Paul brings those two analogies together, drunkenness and the infilling of the Spirit of God. You get a man who's timid and shy by nature. Sometimes if he gets a little bit of drink in him, all of a sudden he can talk quite freely. Sometimes he's got a boldness that he didn't have before. He can go and talk to women with confidence. He can take on the world if needs be. The alcohol begins to affect his walk. It begins to affect his speech. It begins to affect his personality. It begins to affect his actions. Nearly all the time for the worse. But whenever the Spirit of God comes upon a man, and a man receives of the fullness of the Spirit, it gives him confidence, not in himself, but it gives him confidence to do things that normally and naturally he would not be able to do in the flesh. It affects the way he walks. It affects his speech. It affects his motives. It affects his activity. It affects his actions. Maybe today we need the infilling of the Spirit of God more than ever. With all of our fine buildings and all of our great programs and with all of our special meetings and with all of our finance and with all of our organization, maybe we have neglected the spirit of the living God. Substituted him for things that do not count in light of eternity. Be filled with the spirit is a commandment. Be filled. Be filled with the spirit is a necessity. For without the infilling of the Holy Ghost we can do nothing. But be filled with the Spirit is also a glorious possibility. Did you come to the meeting tonight thinking that in this service God could change your life? God could give you a new start even as a Christian? 
God could change your perspective as a believer. You could come into a meeting like this, lukewarm and apathetic and indifferent and powerless and weak and afraid, and then yield your life to the Spirit of God and put your life on God's altar and ask God to cleanse you and ask God to fill you and enter into a life of worth and usefulness and purpose for God. Friend, tonight there is such a thing as the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Multitudes down through history have proved it. The great missionaries, the great preachers, the great evangelists, the great hymn writers, the great prayer warriors, the great Christian workers, they all had one thing in common, despite maybe differences in theology. They believed and experienced the infilling of the Holy Ghost. George Whitfield was a strong Calvinist. John Wesley was swinging towards Arminianism. But they both did a mighty work for God. I'm not sure if D.L. Moody was a theologian at all. They say he was a very simple preacher. But he certainly had an anointing that very few have ever had before or since. So it is with Spurgeon, McShane, R.A. Torrey, David Brainerd, Hudson Taylor, Robert Murray McShane, William Booth, W.P. Nicholson. And the list goes on and on and on. Despite different ideas about baptism despite different ideas about church government, despite different ideas about the extent of sanctification, despite different ideas about election and predestination, I believe if a man yields his life or a woman yields their life to God and gives their life to God as a candidate for the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God can use that person in a wonderful way. Jesus Christ said to the church, a handful of believers on the Mount of Olives, as he began to ask all sorts of questions about the future and about Israel and all of those different things that people like to debate, remember the Lord said, it's not for you to know the times or the powers that the Father has put in his own season, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Tarry in Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. And that early church experienced a breath from heaven, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, just where they were sitting in one accord, in one place, seeking God together with one promise and one gospel and one goal. And they were filled with the Spirit of the living God. And you read in Acts 2, they were filled again. Acts 4, they were filled again. Acts 6, they were filled again. Acts 9, they were filled again. Acts 13, they were filled again. You see, the verb that Paul uses when he says, be filled with the Spirit, it means go on being filled with the Spirit. Keep on going on, being filled by another, by the Spirit of God. Just allow your life to be an empty vessel. And allow the Lord to fill you every day at all times and to keep on filling you again and again and again with the Spirit of the living God. What does it mean? Many people have the idea that the Spirit-filled life is to put on some sort of gospel sideshow, to perform signs and wonders. The infilling of the Spirit of God is to anoint men for service. It's to give boldness in testimony. It's something that the Christian must pray for. It's something we must live in obedience in the expectation of. God has given, it says in Acts 5, 32, the Spirit to them that obey Him. And then we must believe. Some of the most wonderful words that the Savior ever spoke as far as God's people were concerned, was John 7, the last day, John 7, 37 to 39. In that last day, the great day of the feast, listen to what it says, Jesus stood. He stood in order to be seen and cried with a loud voice in order to be heard. He's going to communicate something vital. And he says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. He that believeth in me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe in him should receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus Christ was not yet glorified. But he promised that those who are hungry, and those who are thirsty, and those who come to him, and believe in him, and trust in him, and ask of him, can receive the infilling of the Spirit of the living God. We mentioned Oswald Chambers a couple of nights ago. Oswald Chambers was a Baptist 
preacher from Scotland. He died at the age of 43 in Egypt as he was a chaplain to a certain troop within the British Army. And Oswald Chambers, for a year or two, as a, undoubtedly as a Christian, struggled with powerlessness in his life. In fact, he said that he didn't know that he didn't know any Christian that had what he was looking for. But he knew there was something missing. So much so that he set himself to pray. And he actually said to the Lord, Lord, if this is all that there is to the Christian life, I don't know if the thing's real at all. There must be something more. He, he didn't know all that much, you see, about what the Word of God teaches about the Spirit of God as a young Christian. But one night in a prayer meeting in Dunoon in Scotland, a lady prayed, and in her prayer she quoted Luke 11, verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And like a bolt of lightning, that verse ignited something in his heart. He began to pray, Lord, this is what I'm looking for. I want you to fill me with your Spirit. He said there was no flashing lights, there was no state of euphoria, there was no change at all internally or really externally. Nothing unusual happened, but he left the prayer meeting. And then whenever he went on to preach the gospel, he had a power and an authority and a freedom and a boldness and a success that he had never known before. He realized he'd been laboring in the flesh instead of trusting in the Spirit of God to infill him and to equip him. Later on in his life, in his devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, he said, we cannot imitate being filled with the Holy Ghost. It's something that there's no substitute or imitation for that is real. It is absolutely indispensable. The sovereignty of the Spirit, the personality of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit, the rule of the Spirit, the infilling of the Spirit. One last thought and we're finished. The tenderness of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 16. Whenever the Lord Jesus Christ was being baptized and as he was being baptized, he was praying and the Spirit of God descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and it abode, it rested, it stayed upon him. He was anointed with the Spirit of God. It was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach. And if the Son of God needed an anointing, how much more do you and I to do something for God? But the scripture says in bodily fashion like a dove. Why a dove? Why not an eagle? Or some great bird of prey. It's to symbolize that the dove or the Spirit of God like a dove is tender. The dove is known for its tenderness. The dove is known for its purity. The dove is known for its sensitivity. The dove is known for its mournful song. And friends, tonight the Holy Spirit of God is tender. The Holy Spirit of God is sensitive. The Holy Spirit of God is pure. The Holy Spirit of God mourns. And we can grieve the Spirit of God because of our sins. The Word of God says, Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Spirit of God. Paul right in the church of Thessalonica said, Quench not the Holy Spirit. And we can so easily grieve the Spirit of God by our sin. We can so easily grieve the Spirit of God by our disobedience, by our reluctance. We can so easily grieve the Spirit of God by how we talk to each other, how we talk about each other. We can so easily grieve the Spirit of God whenever we allow pride and bitterness and disunity to enter into our hearts and into our lives. Do you remember Samson? one of the strongest and yet one of the weakest men that ever lived. I don't believe that Samson was one of these guys that you see depicted sometimes you know, in, the, in the storybooks, this man about seven feet tall. It looks like he's been eating chicken fillets and bananas and broccoli from he was born until he was in his 30s. That's never been out of the gym and his steroids and all the rest of it, these huge biceps and the barrel chest and huge arms and legs. I don't think Samson looked like that at all. Because Delilah says, tell me, Samson, wherein the secret of thy strength lieth. There's something secret about it. 
It wasn't about his stature or his physical frame or his training regime or some great diet. It was simply the Spirit of God residing upon him. His hair was a sign of his Nazarite vow, his separation. And whenever Samson allowed his hair to be cut, symbolically breaking his vow of separation, he lost the power of God in his life sleeping in the lap of the harlot and she woke him up and said Samson, Samson the Philistines are upon thee Judges 16.20 Samson arose and began to shake himself and said I will arise and go out at other times but he wist not that the spirit of God or the, the Lord or the power or the anointing of the spirit of God he wist not that the Lord had left him or departed from him not in the absolute sense but in the sense of authority and strength and anointing, the power was gone. And the greater tragedy still was he didn't even realize it until it was too late. He wist not, he knew not that the Lord had departed from him. As he began to stir himself and shake that head of his, all of a sudden he realized that his hair had been cut. And he was weak just like anybody else. And so often the church is just like the world. Maybe because we've grieved the Spirit of God. Sometimes we're just like the unsaved. Maybe because we have grieved the Spirit of God. That's why David prayed, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The sense of the presence of God gone in his life. Do you remember the hymn writer said, Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Return, O holy dove, return. Sweet messenger of rest, I hate the sins that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. The dove is a sensitive bird. Whenever Noah opened the door of his ark, he sent out a raven. And the raven never came back. It flew up and down the face of the waters. It was able to rest and abide upon dead vegetation and floating corpses and carcasses and carrion. But whenever he sent out the dove, the dove could not rest upon that which was unclean. And so the dove came back into the ark, symbolic of the purity of the Holy Spirit. I remember once in Australia, a man rang me. He had been brought up in Northern Ireland in the western part of the province. He lived in the city of Adelaide. He was a missionary to the Jewish people along with his wife. And he had heard that I was from Northern Ireland as well. He contacted me and he asked me to come and stay with him, a lovely Christian man, Christian family. And he got talking about the things of God and began to talk about revival and different things like that. This is over 20 years ago, 21 or 22 years ago now. And he began to talk about Duncan Campbell. And Another brother in the Lord, an independent Methodist minister about a year ago, related exactly the same story because he grew up in the same area and was a member of the same family. 1952, there was a convention started in the western part of the province, the Kiladees Convention. It was almost like a miniature Keswick, uh, that great holiness convention in England, and the Kiladees Convention was in the west of the province. It lasted from 52 to 2002 before it finally finished. But from 1960 to 1969, the Reverend Duncan Campbell preached eight out of those ten years at the Kiladees Convention. Revival was still fresh in his heart from being in the Isle of Lewis and then Uist in the mid-1950s. He was a man sensitive to the Spirit of God. He had preached at Kiladees before and he would preach at Kiladees again. But these two men told me the same story and they said that in one of those meetings, Duncan Campbell was announced to speak he was making his way to the pulpit and after a little while before he began to preach he said I feel that the spirit of God is near he's hovering over and I don't feel led to preach I feel that we should wait in the presence of God and be still and know that he is God because God is near he says, I don't want anybody to pray or anybody to testify or anybody to do it. We just want to wait in the presence of God. And all that were there, the majority of them testified that they had never sensed the Spirit of God as close. And then he believed that they were on the brink of something big, especially Duncan Campbell. Afterwards, he says, I have never felt the Spirit of God as near 
as I did in that meeting, never felt the Spirit of God as near in all my life. And as they were sitting waiting, somebody stood up and began to pray audibly. And this minister that told me says it was my mother was in the meeting and she heard this person pray and they just got up and they waffled and they went on and then they sat down and Mr. Campbell closed the meeting and simply said the spirit of God has been grieved and that was the meeting over. Now that's a strange story to tell but sometimes does God see things in our hearts, our motives, our affections, our lives maybe want to touch the glory and receive the accolades of men and be seen as the one that brought the blessing down or the one that prayed the blessing and the one that's going to be exalted or maybe just insensitivity can grieve the spirit of the living God. Friends, we need a move of the Holy Ghost. We want to live a life that counts, a life lived in light of eternity. To one day hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. A life of surrender, a life of supplication, a life of service. And it's only possible through life in the Spirit. May God apply his word to your hearts tonight. Thank you for having me this week. May God bless you. May God encourage you. And thank you so much tonight for your attention. Mr. Park. So a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we look back over the week and we do so with thanksgiving for the presence of God here, for the word of the Lord that has been proclaimed, and for what we've heard tonight about the Spirit of God, for enabling your servant to just bring these truths afresh to us. And we pray for the work of the Spirit in all of our lives, and we pray that God will get the glory that you'll do a new thing in this province, a new thing in all of our churches, and Lord, making it that little bit personal, a new thing in all of our hearts. Revive the work of God. Revive your people, young and old. Set the church of Jesus Christ on fire. Help us, Lord, to believe in the Holy Spirit, not just the, the academic, intellectual belief, but Lord, in his mighty power to work through us, flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. May we know the infilling and the baptism of divine power for Jesus' sake. Amen. We sing a hymn that is a hymn of prayer, 640, just as we close the meeting tonight. O breath of life, come sweeping through us, revive thy church with life and power. We just gave our seats and we want to sing this prayerfully to the Lord.
just bow our heads in prayer. I want you to take a moment before the Lord to, to thank him in your heart for this week and to pray over tonight's message and ask the Lord to deal with you and revive you, give you the Holy Spirit. So we'll just take a moment to do that quietly, prayerfully. Sing together, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. <laughs> 